Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Huber, an associate curator in the Costume Institute and the co-curator of the exhibition Women Dressing Women, which is currently on view at the museum through Sunday, March 10th. I'd like to begin by thanking you all for joining us this evening and also convey our gratitude to Morgan Stanley for their generous sponsorship of this exhibition and its associated publication. The subject of our panel discussion tonight is empowerment through practice and fashion. And before I introduce our panelists and the important work that they all do, I thought I would provide a very quick overview of the organization of the show to better consider the ways in which our guest work aligns with some of the ideas explored in the exhibition. As the title implies, Women Dressing Women celebrates the work of women fashion designers who are primarily creating within the sector of women's wear. Like most of our fall shows, the exhibition draws upon the incredible permanent collection of the Costume Institute, which helped to serve as a guiding rubric to help winnow down a vast topic, providing both helpful constraints and exciting discoveries. We sought to include as many makers as possible and feature the work of over 70 women fashion designers in the show, including objects that date from the turn of the 20th century to the present day. The exhibition not only highlights the significant impact that women have had on fashion, but in turn, the importance of fashion to women. As one of the few early fields in which they could seek employment and opportunity, providing unprecedented forms of creative, social, and financial autonomy. Accordingly, the bulk of the exhibition is organized to follow a loose chronology that traces a lineage of women makers across time. Underlying this history are four premises that accompany the broader social trajectory of women working in fashion, as charted through the notions of anonymity, visibility, agency, and absence or omission. We begin by considering the condition of anonymity that characterized the vast majority of early dressmakers' work in a field that rarely documented or acknowledged the contributions of individual makers. As we see the emergence of the eponymous couture house in the mid-19th century and the prestige and credit that accompanies the profession of couturier, it is important to recognize the inherently collective nature of design and the many anonymous hands involved in fashion, both historically and presently. The image slideshow featured in our galleries depicts just some of the many women designers and the often forgotten seamstresses embroiderers, and textile mill workers that are so integral to creating fashion. From here, we move to the premise of visibility, a phenomenon that occurs as the modern fashion industry rapidly expands and the artistic and lucrative role of couturier becomes increasingly attractive, often accompanied by forms of more public recognition. Given the hegemony of French haute couture during the early 20th century, which is a bias and strength reflected in our permanent collection, and the proliferation of women designers who are working in France during the interwar period, which is a singular moment in fashion history in which women outnumbered their male counterparts in leading the creative direction of fashion. We focus on couturiers who all trained or worked in Paris within the Apple Gallery space. This pantheon of designers represents the work of 22 women-led houses that were all influential in their time, essentially constructing a women-led canon of early 20th century design. Agency comprises the largest section of the show, which surrounds the perimeter of our Lizzie and Jonathan Tisch gallery, including objects from the early 20th century to contemporary fashion as organized within sub-themes that respond to our collection and exemplify ways that fashion has empowered women as creators, producers, and consumers across time. We explore the work of women who entered fashion from analogous fields such as craft, theater, and fine art, celebrate women who were among the pioneers in establishing an American fashion identity, move through the boutique generation of the 1960s and 70s, and the significance of these spaces as sites of community, to the avant-gardism of the 1980s and 90s, which frequently saw women designers challenging conventional expectations of body ideals, and move all the way to the present. The last section of Women Dress and Women features a series of juxtapositions located at the center of the Tisch Gallery that build upon other exhibition themes and introduce ideas of absence or omission. While anonymity serves as a type of prologue to the show, 
we see the absence section as an epilogue of sorts, indicating that there's always room for addenda or a revision in recorded history. These objects consider fashion from multiple perspectives, touching upon notions of acknowledgement, belonging, representation, and, and opportunity, along with the consideration of the material and corporeal aspects of dress. When working on the show, one of the ideas that was really important to my guest co-curator, Karen Van Gotzenhoven, and myself, was ensuring that we didn't present womanhood as a monolith in terms of making assumptions about ways in which women think or design, or in relation to the wear as well. For this reason, it was important to include objects like the piece at center that was designed by Jasmine So for her label Customiety, which creates for the underserved global community with dwarfism. Sinead Burke, a disability advocate and founder of the organization Tilting the Lens, and one of our guests tonight, produced the mannequin on which the garment is dressed in collaboration with colleagues at Proportion London and the National Museum of Scotland. We're excited to include this garment that celebrates rather than polices the body beneath and introduces a perspective and need that isn't always considered in fashion. Some of the adjacent objects in the section also introduce aspects of lived experience, such as pregnancy or considering trans bodies, and further consider ideas related to adaptability through adjustable cords and channels that empower the wearer to fit the garment to their body, whether as a form of function or aesthetic preference. Grace June of Open Style Lab is here with us today to share more about her important work in creating accessible and adaptable fashion. The last group of objects featured within the agency section of the show is entitled Empowerment Through Practice and considers the ways in which contemporary designers have introduced their ethos and value systems to their work, highlighting makers who are thinking sustainably, creating collaboratively to introduce new perspectives and finding ways to credit partnerships or work slower outside of the typical fashion calendar. Five out of the six ensembles featured in this group are fairly recently designed and objects that to me all emblematize ideas that are critical to the future direction that fashion needs to take. The beautifully quilted garment at center was created using dead stock fabrics and represents a collaboration between Gabriella Hurst from her tenure at the French fashion house of Chloe with the G's Ben quilters based in rural Alabama, which was facilitated by the nonprofit organization Nest. Amanda Lee joins us today from Nest where her and her colleagues work to empower artisans and facilitate these types of creative collaborations in fashion and beyond. And I'm now going to share the bios of the speakers um, that are with us tonight and invite them to join me on the stage. So beginning with Shanae Burke. Uh, Shanae is founder and CEO of Tilting the Lens, a consultancy founded in 2020 with the ambition to create equitable and systemic change through the lever of accessibility. With an all disabled team based across Europe, they craft solutions with disabled people to build an accessible and equitable world. Shanae works on global and local projects with clients on four continents across business, media, public arts, um, academia, and nonprofit sectors on projects that range from creating more accessible environments to building confidence in employing disabled people and advising on required systemic changes within the recruitment journey, workflows, and culture to set up disabled talent for access. Among her many other accomplishments, Shanae has hosted the podcast, Ask Me with Shanae Burke, and published a best-selling and award-winning book for children entitled Break the Mold. Amanda Lee, Nest's Senior Director of Market Access and Sourcing, guides brands and retail partners to achieve their environmental, social and governance goals through, st through strategic and impactful partnerships with artisan vendors. She leads the market access programs at Nest, ensuring that artisans and makers are equipped with the knowledge and skills to build strong market relationships. Prior to her role at Nest, Amanda worked in luxury fashion in New York City, developed artisan programs in Eswatini, and consulted for Target's handcraft vendor projects. Amanda is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. And finally, Grace June is an associate professor at the University of Georgia, 
where she examines the intersection of disability and collaborative design processes. In this space, Grace investigates how accessibility is created and negotiated in creative making. Her upcoming book, Fashion, Disability, and Co-Design, anticipated to be released in May this year by Bloomsbury Publishing, offers a curated sampling of design processes inclusive of disability and a close investigation into clothing applications. Grace has held different positions in the tech industry, academia, and entrepreneurial business. This has influenced her work to be interdisciplinary, leading her to become a founding member of the national award-winning disability profit called Open Style Lab. As a nonprofit, Open Style Lab celebrates its 10th year since starting at MIT as a public service project. The organization is a disability and women-led nonprofit organization leading the way in educating for a more inclusive future through co-design with the disabled community. Um, so please, uh, I'd like to welcome our guest to the stage now. Um, well, I want to start by thanking you all for joining me tonight. Um, it's such an impressive group of, of women that we have on the stage um, on the very first day of Women's History Month, no less. Um, <laughs> um, and though I've introduced you all as individuals and read your bios, we thought it would be helpful to begin the conversation by in turn asking you all to introduce your respective organizations to our audience. Um, and I had asked you all to share a project or an, or an image um, that gave an example of the critical work that you all do. Um, so I'm going to advance, and I think we'll start with Shanae at Tilting the Lens. Wow. There we go. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> this is a wild Friday night. What an honor and a treat to be here. I'm going to begin, for access reasons, by giving a visual description of the images on screen, and then of me also, and then continue. So on screen, there are two images, one of which has an enormous amount of ego attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> so on the left-hand side is the cover of British Vogue's May 2023 issue, Reframing Fashion. There is no easy way to say this with humility, but it features me. <laughs> My name is Sinead. I'm a white cisgendered woman who uses the pronouns she and her. I identify as queer and physically disabled. I'm a proud dwarf woman and a little person. On the cover of the image, I am wearing a full-length custom Alexander McQueen dress, which is white with a button-up shirt and with a kick-ass metal belt. And I'm standing on a podium. And there is language on the front cover that says reframing fashion. And there is three key words which took a long time to pick and choose. They are dynamic, daring, and disabled. And the rationale behind those three words is because often when we talk about disability, particularly through a non-disabled lens, we are either inspirations or there is this need to distance ourselves from the language of disability. I myself am an incredibly proud disabled woman. I think it's really important that in an institution like British Vogue, we put that word very clearly on the cover of the magazine. But on the right-hand side is something I'm incredibly proud of. It is a two-page spread of this issue made available in Braille. It was the first time ever that Vogue was made available in Braille. And from this issue, they made a continuous long-term commitment to ensure that it was made available in Braille. And in terms of the visual description for myself, mm -hmm. I have brown shoulder length hair that is almost Anna Wintour-like in the Anna Wintour <laughs> Costume <laughs> Institute. While she's in Paris, I'm here, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> and I'm wearing a full length silk Tory Burch dress for the theme of this evening in terms of women dressing women, which has lots of detail in terms of kind of ropes and knots and is really very beautiful. 
But the image on screen is, is merely just an image. What it is is an example of an output. And while I get to be in the image that is put forward to you tonight, it doesn't detail the extraordinary team, largely of disabled women, who led and made this image happen. To tell you a long story very succinctly, in 2019, I was asked if I wanted to be on the cover of the September issue of British Vogue, curated by the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, photographed by Peter Lindbergh. Casual. <laughs> I said yes, not knowing anything. And it was an amazing, surreal experience. It happened to be the first time that a little person was ever on the cover of Vogue magazine ever in the world. And while that was an honor to be able to take that credential, it also made me question, where are the people who've come before me? Where are the people who've come after me? I think it's probably quite honest to say my experience on that set wasn't very accessible. I had to be lifted onto the hair and makeup chair because nobody thought of my access needs. I left that day thinking, if I ever have the opportunity, I want to ensure that disabled people can thrive in spaces like this. Little did I know that a year later, Edward Enninful, who was at the time the editor-in-chief editor of British Vogue and the first black man to hold the role, called me <laughs> and said, hey, we're thinking of doing a disability and accessibility focused issue at British Vogue. We don't know what to do. We think you and your team will. And in the interim period, I had moved from thinking of myself as an individual advocate to wanting to create and build a collective to build systemic change. And the rationale and reason for that is the pandemic. If we look at the impact of the pandemic on disabled lives, in England, six out of 10 people who died of COVID-19 were disabled. If we look to the way in which we talked about disabled people or those with chronic illnesses in that moment, we talked about them being vulnerable, having underlying conditions, erasing their humanity. There are still many, many people who it isn't safe for them to be here this evening, and I'm so glad that we're streaming this online and have a hybrid opportunity. I asked myself the question in the pandemic, did the fashion industry become more accessible because I was part of it, or did it become more accessible for me? And that idea of moving from the individual to the collective was much needed. And now I work with an amazing, kick-ass team of disabled women. Two of them are here tonight. Make it your business to meet them and say hello to them. I'm going to embarrass them. They're in the front row. You'll find them. <laughs> so when we took on this project as tilting the lens rather than as an individual, we had to start from the very beginning. The output of wanting disabled people to be in vogue is one thing, but how do they get in the room? We had to create a survey that, edit, that audited every single production space in the UK to have an understanding of what meaningful access looks like. Places will tell you that they're accessible and they only have one step. Great. Or they have a hearing loop, but it's just not working today. Great. There was only two spaces available to shoot this. Both of them were unavailable and already had bookings. We had to negotiate with them in order for disabled people to access it. But what did it mean to have a quiet room on set? What did it mean to have a space where autistic and neurodivergent people could stim? What did it mean for those who were compromised to be able to be set up for success? We had five covers with disabled people from different backgrounds and different identities. We had 19 disabled people inside. Every journalist who participated in the issue was disabled, increasing British Vogue's database of disabled talent also. We also had deep online content, thinking about disability in the broadest possible terms, also having disabled writers not write about themselves or disability. We're so proud of this project. And we're so proud that many of the commitments that came from this will continue. But the reality is one disability issue is important, but it's not enough. I fundamentally believe that every issue is a disability <laughs> issue. And thinking about the work that we've been doing at Tilting the Lens about evolving visibility as the metric of success. And I think what we're going to be speaking about today, I love that we have greater representation of disabled people in fashion. But I don't just want it on the cover of magazines. I want it in the boardroom. And we have work to do. But thank you so much. I don't even know what I was going to say. I was just saying that's <laughs> no. what you were saying. Um, I was like, I am next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Lee. I am the Senior Director of Market Access and Sourcing at a nonprofit organization called Nest. Nest supports artisans and makers globally. Um, we work with 120, we work across 120 um, countries and support nearly 3,000 businesses through market access and education for these makers. Handcraft is a fundamental source of employment for women globally, particularly those in rural, low-income, and under-resourced areas. 
Um, Kraft, in fact, is the second largest employer of women um, in developing economies, second only to agriculture. And that is resulting in a $526, $526 billion um, industry. We also know that women, when they have access to income, they're more likely, um, three times more likely, to invest that into their children's education and their family needs more so than their male counterparts. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Um, because of this, um, Nest very intentionally sits at the intersection of handcraft and market access. One of those channels is um, brand collaborations. A great example of this is, um, I think it was in maybe the past couple slides, um, the collaboration between the G's Ben Quilters and Chloe, which is being featured at the exhibit now. This is Sharon Williams. She is a G's Ben Quilter. We have been working with the community for four years now to help them build um, business development skills and market access, um, and often these brand collaborations come out as a result of them. Um, to date, we have um, to date we have raised over $100 million of direct revenue to these women, um, and so this really just shows the power of collaboration and um, partnerships. And I know Grace has brought a video, which I'm going to try to play. So, we'll yes, the medical definition is that I have a disability. But when it comes to the social definition, I think that these products are disabling me. And I say that because the only time I really think about my disability is when I'm challenged with a product that I can't use. And then I hack it, and then I can use it. Even though if I was living by myself and my arms didn't work, I was able to figure out a way to feed myself I was able to figure out a way to type. But one of the big things in the winter is that I have to stay bundled up. So I needed a coat that I could slide on easily myself. My hands were becoming purple because I had nothing to cover my arms when I went out and I was getting sick. So I was referred to Grace Hi, my name is Grace Jun. I am the executive director at Open Style Lab. Open Style Lab aims to make style accessible for people of all abilities, regardless of cognitive or physical disability. We bring engineers, occupational or physical therapists, and designers together to collaborate with people with disabilities to co-create anything that is related to style. So it could mean wearable tech devices to accessible garments, but they're doing it together. We were able to make Christina a coat with boning across the neck so she could bite onto the boning and flip the coat over her head. And most importantly, the sleeves were kind of like these sacks where she could rest her arms. It was also two-piece, so there was a dress component, but she could also wear the coat whenever she wanted to outside. Open Style Lab opened up my creativity and being able to make this change with them was so important to my happiness. So really, you know, giving me that gift is one of the best gifts I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> Since I met Christina, it just kind of took off. Not only did I see her as a collaborator, but she became one of my best friends. The friendship and admiration just grows, and she became a bridesmaid in my wedding that happened most recently. Mm. For my wedding, I wanted to be able to hold the bouquet. So I spent probably the first three hours in the morning as a bridesmaid trying to figure out how to make this bouquet stay. <laughs> we need to figure out like a weight balance with this flowery thing and clear bra straps that we need to put together in three hours. So we hacked it on the fly, it worked, and then it easily snapped off, and I was like, good, job done. Now we can go celebrate and get some drinks <laughs> and congratulate you. <laughs> so if you took anything away from this video, <laughs> thank you. If you took anything away from this video is that I would make a pretty good bridesmaid. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I wanted to show you one of the most life-changing moments at Open Style Lab is meeting all of these wonderful people, my team, 
my executive director. And when you think about collaborations and systems of change and inclusion with purpose, I think you can't forget about relationships. Mm -hmm. So this is the big reason why I wanted to show this video. Since then, Open Style has celebrated its 10th year, so happy birthday to us, <laughs> we made it <laughs> as a nonprofit. We have a wonderful new executive director uh, sitting in the audience and probably ask you to speak to her after. Mm -hmm. um, but most of all, before our mid-transition, I wanted to make sure we were not only just women-led, but also disability-led. So about more than 50 or 60% of our team are people with disabilities from all types of backgrounds. And this was important because all the activities and educational work we do do require skill sets, but also representation and culture. And part of the educational program that I had designed back at MIT and replicated during my time at Parsons School of Fashion for a few years, uh, <laughs> yes, Parsons, um, has really been recognized, I hope, uh, worldwide that it is possible to have interdisciplinary education and to drive creativity as a way to problem solve as well as to challenge existing norms. So most of the work that we do has really been looking at how do we get people together, how do we create a more accessible space mm -hmm. uh, and have more people that you can find and relate that look like you and be represented in that space. Um, typically, we have summer programs that are 10 weeks, which was recognized by the Smithsonian National Award, and I had the pleasure of being announced by Sinead uh, back in 2019. Uh, and we have another one coming this year. And each theme is various and different. So from shoes to accessible shopping to wearable technology, we find ways to investigate barriers where the doors are closed and not accessible for mm -hmm. most people. I really strongly know and believe that one out of five people identify in the United States as having a disability, but four out of five people, I think, know and love someone with a disability. And therefore, this market is a bigger market than just something that's mm -hmm. niche. And therefore, um, I think there is so much room for innovation. And design, instilled by my parents, really is a power and generating motivation mm -hmm. to create some of that change in a fun and an exciting way. Mm -hmm. So I hope you guys stay tuned mm -hmm. and um, enjoy our talk. But I'll mm -hmm. leave it here. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you all for that. What an incredibly impressive group we have here. Um, it's so exciting. You know, I was going to start by asking you all about the involvement of women in your organizations, but I think that you've mm. actually made a pretty strong case <laughs> for how critical women have been to the work that all of you do, which is one common thread between all of these organizations. And I might add, uh, the Costume Institute staff is currently 75% woman identifying um, and historically um, very much has relied on um, the imagination and perseverance of woman, uh, women since we first came to the Costume Institute, or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, rather. Um, so I wanted to pivot and sort of pick up on something that you were talking about, Grace, and that's the idea of education, which I think is another thing that um, all of your organizations really share and um, are so connected to. Um, you know, whether it's training artisans and equipping them with new skills, to teaching new generations of students, to serving as consultants and, and advocates. Um, and I wonder if you could perhaps talk about or share some of the critical tools that come into play um, when it comes to education and working with others and this idea that's also come up of creating lasting change. Oh, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess I could start yeah. as an educator. Um, <laughs> I never thought I would be teaching, first off. Uh, and full disclosure, I'm also um, really excited to kind of talk about this topic because it's one of the biggest barriers where people could better just understand and take their time to understand challenges, uh, as well as different uh, studies and fields. So for Open Style Lab, really, education is kind of the crux of everything mm -hmm. we do. And learning is kind of learned, I mean, learning is acquired through making as well. So as you make, as you design and craft, you are also acquiring skills and a new tool to be able to communicate some of your ideas. And so our 10-week summer program, our workshops, really try to find ways to equip our community, 
uh, people either from marginalized families or homes, different demographics, to be able to have those skill sets and to meet people from interdisciplinary fields. And some kind of, I think, uh, thing I've learned for the past eight years of doing this program <laughs> is really that there's no one way to learn. And the more diversified you're able to give uh, an approach and a style to how people could think about different tool sets or different curriculum, the better that they will feel empowered to be learning. I also see some of my students here, so I, I hope they take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, but one of the examples I can think of at OpenStyle was a toolkit that was featured in that video that you had just seen, which by the way is open to the public on YouTube, uh, documented by Target uh, and featured on Hulu. But that toolkit was designed with NYU's initiative with women's with disabilities. And so that 10 years, <laughs> uh, for those 10 years, I mean, those 10 weeks that we worked with them, we realized, forget about clothing or style, the girls really wanted to just express themselves and find the tools to be able to make for themselves. So we ended up creating that summer a, an adaptive sewing toolkit for any of the girls to be able to, with and without a disability, to be able to equip themselves and learn those skills uh, instead of prescribing something that's already pre-made. Mm -hmm. But I could say that's one very interesting mm -hmm. example. I can go next. Um, I'm an elementary school teacher by training. That's where my career began. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, you are now my classroom. <laughs> and much like Grace spoke to, education is a fundamental lever to our work at Tilting the Lens. We have three of them, education, advocacy, and design. Education, because fundamentally we don't know what we don't know. And whether you are, like me, a disabled woman, there is still so much in which one's expertise and awareness continues to grow. Advocacy, because in order to think about systemic change, it has to be top down, bottom up, mm -hmm. and sideways. And design, because whether we think about the built environment, a program, a policy, a behavior, or a mindset, all of which have been designed to be largely inaccessible, which is really challenging to think of. But the positive about that is there's an opportunity to change it and to redesign it. In terms of education, it's fundamental to our work, both in the private sector and in the public sector. But education and who gets to access edu education has been a key mandate for us. So, as I shared, you know, when we think about the advancements of disability and fashion from a structural and systemic lens, we have seen amazing advancements as regards to representation, though I will say still not enough, but also in the arena of adaptive product. There are some amazing disability-led brands. I think of Liberare. I think of Chewy. I think of Unhidden. But in many ways, they exist in an ecosystem that the fashion system typically and traditionally excludes. And as we think about the need and the work of co-design processes, it's so important that we center lived experience. But one of our big ambitions is to move disabled people as not just consumers, but creatives, to move them into having the opportunity to have long-term careers. A couple of years ago, I was reading Women's Wear Daily, because that's what I do at 5 a.m. <laughs> and I saw a note that came out to say that there was a new dean of fashion appointed to Parsons School of Design. Usually, I would kind of potentially flip through an article like that or read it in concise detail, but something really struck me. It said that the person identified as disabled and queer. So about four seconds later, I was in their Instagram DMs. <laughs> I was like, hi, we should chat. That person's Dr. Ben Barry. And we did, we chatted. I said, we should do something together. I'm not sure he was ready for my level of enthusiasm, particularly <laughs> from afar. And I said, how do we think about not just disabled models, not just disabled consumers? How do we think about disabled designers? Mm -hmm. How do we get disabled designers into the ateliers of Paris, of Milan, of New York, of London? How do we think about setting people up for success with careers, not one-off projects that are incredibly important but don't sustain income and housing and by building families and lives? So we had this idea to create a program in partnership with Parsons and Tilting the Lens, where we would fully fund disabled students to come through a multitude of Parsons programs. 
We got to announce it on December 3rd of last year, thanks to the kind investment from the Ford Foundation, among others. And in September of this year, three disabled students will start in those programs. And in September of next year, another three disabled students will start. And in the September of the year after and the year after, because what we don't want is to also create exceptions in individuals who feel othered and alone in a system that is often not designed for them. So we're covering their academic fees. We are covering, if needed, their housing fees. Also ensuring that people don't have to work while they are participating in the program if they don't wish to or it's inaccessible to them. And also making sure that the infrastructure of Parsons in and of itself is accessible. Because in our practice, there is no such thing as a hierarchy of a disability or a hierarchy of access. So what I'm excited about and what the work is to do right now is to get the fashion system ready for those students. So how do you get a power wheelchair using designer into an atelier in Paris? I don't know, but it's gonna be fun to try. <laughs> and the thing is, we can't wait until they graduate. We have to do it now. So if you have a role within the fashion industry, what can you do tomorrow to help ensure that not just those students, but anybody who has an experience of disability throughout their lifetime of being part of the fashion system can not just participate, but can thrive? Um. Thank, thank you so much for that answer, Shanae. And you know, I have to say, we've, we've talked about this a little bit, but I think that um, education happens so frequently, and, and you've alluded to this as well with the amazing video, um, Grace, but a lot of that learning happens just through interaction and, and working with others. And um, one of the exhibition objects in, in Women Dressing Women is a Clean Estrada ensemble, yeah. which um, the incredible model, Aaron Rose, Rose Phillip, wore on the runway. Um, and we worked with Aaron and traveled to France together to create this custom mannequin. And part of that process entailed um, us at, as museum staff working with Aaron and her manager and the um, mannequin manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And we had to make sure that that space was accessible mm -hmm. for her. And that whole process of the back and forth, and you know, because we were distant, we had to. Um, request videos of the space, and there was so much back and forth. But that taught us so much about the process too, and really made me look at the space with entirely new eyes. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, one mm -hmm. step may seem like a small thing, but it's actually quite monumental right. um, when it's someone with a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So um, there's always so many opportunities for learning and, and education. Um, but Amanda, I know with Nest, you're yeah. also working with such a range of artisans all over the world, um, so many different scales of, of groups and in so many different areas. I wonder if you could share a little bit more about that type of work that, that Nest does as well. Yeah, in relation to education, um, I think this is, again, very fundamental, <laughs> so similar. Our work is different but adjacent, but this is definitely a fundamental um, part of Nest. It's part of how we were founded, um, really kind of the... the the genesis of Nest was kind of the teach Amanda Fish type of mentality. So we often, um, when our founder went um, and located artisans, um, this was the same year that Mohammed Yunus had won the Nobel Peace Prize for microfinancing, and she was like, that's awesome, but I also see that that is also loans equals debt means just a very vicious cycle. And so funda uh, fundamentally, education is the, the groundwork of what Nest is. Um, you know, we also do market access, and that's how you saw that um, piece in collaboration with Chloe, but getting to that point was working with the quilters to understand those expectations, working with the quilters to understand um, how to how to work through pricing and how to, um, I mean, they know how to quilt better than I do, but a lot of the business <laughs> development skills. And so that is a, essentially the same model that we use across all our artisans and makers that we work with. Um, and I think most importantly, um, all these programs we run are maker design and led. Um, and I think that is something we always come to time and time again. Um, in terms of how we structure things and able to really meet their needs mm -hmm. um, is that we um, really have them take the first lead in terms of what they're wanting. And I think a critical part of that too is um, part of the, the panel title for tonight, empowerment, and mm -hmm. how you're em empowering people that you're educating through mm -hmm. that work as well. Um, I wonder if we could talk about fashion since <laughs> right, we're, we're at the Met and, and um, I'm from the Costume Institute. Obviously, it's quite a, a complicated industry, and um, you know all of you have engaged with it in, in various ways. Um, 
I wonder if you could share a little bit about some of your major accomplishments and you know, one thing that's come up a lot in terms of talking about those types of collaborations and, and types of work is, is dealing with pre-existing systems where you're constantly encountering obstacles and hearing why something can't happen or why something won't work or um, what you need to work against. And I know that um, you've found ways to counter those obstacles um, from a variety of different approaches. So um, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Go for I'll it. go yeah. first. I mean, <laughs> Robin's I think, so polite. <laughs> fashion is so powerful. I mean, again, I'll, I'm going to just bring it back to the quilters because really kind of that is mm -hmm. um, so part of the exhibit and I think they exemplify so many of these themes here today. Um, this is multi, this is a uh, intergenerational craft that is passed down. Very often craft is that type of thing where it's grandmother to mother to daughter. Um, and I think when we started working with the quilters in 2019, um, they were primarily primarily the older women, they're still crafting because it kind of passed the time and because their mothers had, had shown them. Um, and just within four years, um, we really are seeing grandmother sitting side and shoulder to shoulder with her daughter and her granddaughter all quilting together. And um, some of my favorite stories to tell is she came up to me and she said that she saw my stuff in Vogue yeah. and now she wants to also be part of Vogue. And so I think it's, it's really fun, but I really do think the most important piece here is that cultural preservation, which is another tenant of NEST and, and really what we do strive to do um, and how, how fashion is, you know, the connecting thread to all of that is, is just so neat to see that come through. Absolutely. And, you know, these quilters are working often on their porches, if you, as you exactly. said, and it's very sort of small scale and, and part of a cottage industry. Um, what was the, or what is the experience like when you're collaborating with a major fashion house like Chloe? Is that something that they're able to, to work with? Do they seem to understand the needs? Is there any sort of dissonance or mm -hmm. challenges that um, enter the picture in, in those types of si situations? Sure, I mean, I mean, going back to education, I mean, the way we <laughs> set up Zoom, it was like, 12 quilters in a room looking at like a laptop screen and then the you know the Paris Chloe team um, it was comical in so many ways but um, the way we really work is you know really to let the quilters decide how they want to set up their structure in terms of payment when they want to deliver um, I think the Chloe team for this one specifically um, offered a lot of their dead stock materials and just gave it to them gave them some inspiration images and um, they all work together mm -hmm. to kind of establish that. So um, that's often how we work with them and with any of our maker communities is again, having them lead and telling us what they're comfortable with, um, how they want, yeah. what they want to get out of it as well. Um, and again, it's, for those that don't know the Giesman quilters, a quick history there is that they were, they were making quilts out of like feed sacks and like old torn jeans and things like that to keep themselves warm. And Chloe gave them like crepe de chine, you know? Wow. So it's like, I think it blew their mind. And I talked to Sharon yesterday. She was like, it was so slippery. I had no idea what to do with it. But just the ingenuity, I think, in terms of how she manipulated the fabric. And she was like, if I can do that Chloe jacket, I can do anything. Yeah. Um, and so it's just, just the adaptability there is also just remarkable to see as well. Absolutely. And, you know, when it comes to design, I know we've talked about this in relation to your mannequin, Sinead, mm -hmm. for example. Um, often there aren't tools in place, um, which I think also relates to the, the kit that you were talking about, Grace. Um, do you want to maybe share a little bit, bit about those ideas and projects? Do you want to do the kit and then I'll do the mannequin? <laughs> <laughs> well, the kit, I think the video could explain very well. But, I mean, if we're going to talk about fashion, uh, it's such a vehicle for self-expression. And at Open Style Lab, we really look at the research and how that vehicle is tied to uh, the body and the perceptions of the body. And I think sometimes we forget, like, clothes aren't just static. It's mm -hmm. also yes. moving. Mm -hmm. And so as it moves with you, uh, how does that interact with your body? How does that be perceived by other people as a cultural and social norm? And in that way, you know, aging is really the disability that we'll all face at some point. And it's such a testament to say that our bodies are constantly changing. So shouldn't our clothes and our fashions do as well? Mm -hmm. And that toolkit was really one of the ways to give, I think, to the themes of this talk, agency, back to people who want to express themselves for themselves. 
And so with the young girls with disabilities, they were able to make pocket stencils uh, and place pockets in wherever they wanted to choose for the outfits that they desired and loved most. And so that also breeds uh, and promotes accountability, yeah. uh, makes sure things are more sustainable. We used a lot of donated materials from Walmart Company and other partners that were quite generous to look at the whole cycle of the fashion system can be uh, economic, and it mm -hmm. could also be circular in a way that's inclusive. Mm. Similarly, when setting up and founding Tilting the Lens three years ago, the vision for the company was to disrupt some of the fashion system's historical relationship with disability, which, by my definition, has too often relied on the narrative of disability as charity and disabled people sitting within the charitable model. We are deliberately a for-profit company with a strategic roadmap which ensures that our profits reinvest back into disabled people and ensuring that our team is all disabled, for example. But in terms of that, it has given us also a new framework as to how we think about we engage with the fashion system. I think when I started, my big ambition was to have adaptive product available everywhere. My and our work collectively has evolved so that our pillars are now people, places, policy, product, and promotion. And the rationale for that is that it's about moving the mindset of the fashion system thinking about disabled people as solely customers. For anybody who's engaged in this space, I imagine many of us can reel these statistics off when you're asked about, what's the business case of disabled people being customers within the fashion system? Mm -hmm. It's more than a billion people. It's sometimes $2 trillion as discretionary income. But what those statistics don't tell you is that in most developing countries, 50 to 75% of disabled people are outside the labor market. If you're disabled here in the US and receive SSI benefits, there is a limitation as to what can be in your checking account before you are means tested to be able to access financial stability and healthcare. Those details around the business case do not tell the full picture as regards the systemic barriers that exist. So to give you a sense of some of the projects, we are really interested in getting disabled people into long-term employment within fashion, particularly in retail. Anybody know what a client advisor in a luxury retail store roughly earns per year with commission? It's about $100,000. It's not bad. We're all going to work there tomorrow. No. <laughs> but what does it look like to set disabled people up for success in that environment? So we did a program where we ensured that there was disabled employees employed in different retail stores around the world. One of them was in London with a deaf employee. Immediately, there was a question of headcount. There was a question of assistance and support. There was a question of, will this person reach their sales targets because they are deaf? Assuming that, again, disability was a deficiency rather than a tool for innovation. It will not surprise anybody in this section of the room to know that that person was the highest selling client advisor year on year in that store because customers were traveling to be able to communicate and transact in their first language. Another example of even thinking about places. So often when we think of making spaces accessible, and the US is a great example of this, our mindset is usually about compliance only. Mm -hmm. And the Americans with Disabilities Act, though very important, was never to be seen as the ultimate definition of access, but to be a living, breathing document. But when we think about so many buildings that have historic prowess and meaning, it often means we can't make them accessible. So we do nothing. But if you go to a Gucci store here in New York, because you know, that's what you might do on a Saturday, particularly if you're blind and low vision, if you don't know the app Ira, A-I-R-A, you are connected with a real life person. That person has permission to seek the back and to use the back camera of your phone and can navigate you through that space independently. Cool. How do we think about digital accessibility not being a way in which that removes human connection but improves it? Hmm. And then as we think about product and promotion, there's a way in which digital accessibility can be a meaningful communicator. But Melissa, you asked me about the mannequin. And I wasn't <laughs> going to share this story, but I came out and I saw Kaya in the audience, so I'm going to. Kaya and I share a birthday. Hi. <laughs> I'm so proud of the mannequin. I'm so proud that a mannequin of a body of a little person exists. But I won't lie. When we were first talking about the exhibition, when I first saw it, and I saw the customiety piece, it's so beautiful. But it reveals more of my body than I often do. I wouldn't say that I am a modest dresser, 
but it's a lot of business chic most of the time, and I like a gown, <laughs> even in casual settings. <laughs> and it's interesting, in the promotion of this event, the Met and the Costume Institute have done great work in terms of communicating to people and creating radical invitations for different communities to come along. But the comments have been a nightmare, as they are. Grace very kindly said, don't read the comments. <laughs> I said, they're educational. <laughs> Which I found they are. Because what the comments were about was about my physical body. So as a dwarf woman with a chondroplasia, I have rolls in my arms. They're very evident in the image. And it's because there's a lot of muscle trying to fit in a small space. My hips are also tilted. It's part of my genetic condition, which means my stomach protrudes. And in a lot of the conversation around the mannequin, it has been quite framed around whether or not it's flattering, whether or not it's palatable, whether or not the mannequin of me still fits within traditional beauty norms. And it's really challenging because as we begin to open up who gets to be part of the fashion system, we still have fat phobic and ableist definitions yeah. of beauty. But here's the thing. In the course of our engagement about this project, I have had a bit of a roller coaster in my own acceptance of it. Because you know what I needed to see when I was 12 years old? I needed to see that mannequin. I needed to see a physical representation of somebody who was proud of their body, not despite the fact that it was different, but because it was different. So if I think about the fashion system, being able to see somebody who, and a physical reference of pride, in who you are despite industry norms or definitions of beauty. And guess what? We design those two. We can change them. <laughs> it's like the Oscars. I sing you out. You know, we could adapt. Oh, and yeah, I'll you can have mine. Just bend over my mic. Yeah. There's somebody coming. Um, well, just as we're about to wrap up, to add a little, <laughs> a little suspense to that moment, um, I wanted to first say, Shanae, that um, I'm so appreciative of you giving us permission to reproduce that yeah, mannequin, which I think is such a beautiful and important moment in the exhibition. Yeah. And um, when we were selecting the objects that are featured in the show that focus on different bodies from what we typically see in fashion, it was really important to us that we um, expressed the idea that fashion is for everyone, and that um, often I think when you look at adaptable clothing or you read about any clothing or the way that women are expected to dress or present themselves to the world, there is this narrative of covering up your flaws or mm -hmm. camouflaging or hiding body parts and trying to make yourself conform and, and fit into a system. And um, the spirit of this exhibition is really about celebration mm -hmm. and um, showing difference and showing the beauty in that. So um, it's been an honor and, and a privilege to work with you mm -hmm. and, and all of you to be able to, to realize those stories in the show. Um, and as I've told you, the, the mannequin that we produced with Aaron Rose Phillip was inspired by your collaboration with the National Museum Scotland. So um, we've talked a lot about this idea of a ripple effect of mm -hmm. actions, and I think that they're just so important and hopefully, you know, we're all building off of each other's work and learning from each other constantly. Um, as, we, as we wrap up, because I know we're out of time, unfortunately, um, I did want to share, we have a slide with some links to all of your incredible organizations so our visitors can read and, and learn more. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to ask if any of you had any advice for our audience members who might be um, designers or practitioners, students, or, or even consumers in terms of ways that they might approach their own engagement with fashion mm -hmm. um, and find empowerment through their actions or, or find ways to get involved in, in some of the amazing work that you're all doing. Okay. <laughs> well, first, buy my book, please. <laughs> um, talking about education. It's coming out May 16th. Pre-orders already on Barnes & Nobles. Um, <laughs> But really, it's no pressure, a collection of 
the work I've done in my life for the past eight years. It took me a long time to write this book, and I wanted to celebrate it to more students, because every time when you ask uh, students or designers come to you to be like, how do I get more engaged? I was like, there's so many pictures, so many people I can think of to connect you with. I need to write a book. But on that note, really engage with Open Style Lab. I, I can't encourage more. We're having our summer program here in New York. Uh, go to www.openstylelab.org, support us uh, to be engaged and to be involved in our workshops as well. We really look forward to communicating and collaborating with all types of people. So if you've got a skill set in mind and you're not sure where it fits, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just let us know and we'll try to figure something out. Mm -hmm. uh, just not during spring break, maybe. <laughs> um, but I think for anyone in general who's maybe enthusiastic about this space, the biggest advice I can tell you is don't do it alone. Yeah. And I think this is important, and I see this even in academia when they're talking about more diverse faculty, colored faculty, disabled faculty coming in. It's not enough to have one person. They're in their own island once they're being hired or being involved in a project or an organization. So do it together and find the spaces like Open Style Lab, to be able to do it with people who are also embracing that in an interdisciplinary way so you feel supported. That would be my biggest takeaway. I will buy your book. <laughs> um, for me, I think the through line for all of this is um, multilateral collaboration. I think as a nonprofit organization, we work with philanthropies, foundations. We also work with individuals, which I'll get to. And as you know, brands. Um, and just echoing Grace, it's we really need it to be um, collective in order to really make sustainable impact. Everyone kind of, you know, putting their interest into it. Nest as an organization, as part of our educational um, programming, we have a pro bono fellowship program. Um, so sometimes they're like, I'm a lawyer and I don't know anything. And I'm like, well, we can use you. Artisans need contracts. And so really just knowing your skills can go far. They're incredibly impactful. We match you with an artisan, um, and you work on a project together. And so it's just a really great way to um, build mutual learning, ultimately. And so um, you can read more at buildingnest.org. But just thank you so much. Um. In terms of takeaways, I guess I have uh, an ask and an offer around help. So it's Friday night in New York. I imagine some of you, if not all of you, are going to go out for dinner tonight, if not, maybe tomorrow. And I want you, for the next week, at the very least, to think about every time you make a decision, whether it's a reservation or a booking, to ask, is this accessible? Now, what do you think the person on the end of the phone or the email is going to say? Rebecca Coakley has it. Yeah, we just have one step. Or, I think so. And the reality is the emotional labor around access is so often left to disabled people, particularly those who are multiply marginalized. And we shouldn't think about access as only a route which disabled people have to undertake as if it is their burden or their fault, rather than acknowledging as regards to the social model of disability that it is the environment that's inaccessible, not disabled people themselves that are at fault or need to do mm. the labor. So it is up to all of us to be thinking about a more accessible and equitable world. And then the second thing I will say is, how can we help? As an organization of five people, there is a lot that we can do, but we can only do so much. And much like you were talking about, you know, success is in strategic partnerships, but it's also in learning. Our, e our website is up here, tiltingthelens.com, but our email where you'll find all of us is team at tiltingthelens.com. So are you a young designer who came tonight because they were dragged by a friend and have never really thought about, oh, somebody has, have never, really thought, <laughs> have never really thought about this topic before and all of a sudden now want to do a thesis on it. How can we help? If you're a parent, if you are trying to figure out that your teenager is about to go to college and doesn't know what to wear and doesn't know how to figure it out, how can we help? If you are a young person who is lost and doing a job that they hate and really want to do something with purpose, how can we help? How can we give back to you? I don't know yet, but we'll figure it out. Thanks. Well, 
Thank you all so much, and thank you for the work that you do. It's so impressive and, and so inspiring. Um, I just wanted to end by reminding all of our visitors that um, the museum is open until 9 p.m. tonight, so if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, I, I hope that you'll all uh, visit the galleries and see Women Dressing Women, which has been extended through March 10th, so we'll be open during International Women's Day on, on March 8th, which is very exciting. Um, and we also have a catalog available in the gift shop as well. So um, thank you again, and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thanks so much. Oh, so exciting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. I can take my...